it's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reeson. Welcome to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. And today, I mean, I know, I know I say, oh, every week it's the best week. But this week, I am so pumped. I couldn't be more excited for today's show. And so I am here with my new friend and guest, Jesse Cole. So Jesse, for any of you that are watching where you can actually see, he has a book called Find Your Yellow Tux. I just heard a new one's coming out in 2022. But even more than that, we are kindred spirits. And when you just meet somebody and you, you know who they are, you, you know just something about them, you know you get, to, you get to really dig in deep. So how I'm going to introduce Jesse officially today is not about everything that he has done in his bios and his reference, but I'm actually going to read something from his book. All right, so this is Jesse, but this is what you would hear about Jesse a long, long time from now. It's Jesse's eulogy. Jesse Cole was the ultimate showman who entertained millions by bringing energy, enthusiasm, and enjoyment to everything he touched. A person who inspired millions to challenge the status quo, to be different, and to live the life of their dreams. A person who truly cared for others, was always there for anyone who would give them everything he had, and the most loving husband and father to his wife and kids. He devoted his life to them and made them happy. That, my friends, is Jesse Cole. Welcome, Jesse. (laughs) <laughs> that is a first. Reading my eulogy that I wrote many years ago still stands true, but that was a first to introduce me. So thank you. I, I'm glad that I'm still alive. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and what's so cool about this is I've written my eulogy. In my book, I have my eulogy in there too. So when I saw that in your book, it was perfect. <laughs> well, it's, it's a really great tool, and I've learned it from a few people, but start with the end of mind. With whatever you do, start with the end of mind. And that's how you can dream big and really kind of put a perspective on where you're going and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So, so for all of you that can see Jesse, but if you're listening on the radio and you can't see him, he's got his yellow tux on. So why the yellow tux, Jesse? Tell me more about that. <laughs> that's a long story, but yes, I mean, I, I played baseball my whole life, tore my shoulder, uh, started working for one of the, the worst baseball teams in the country. When I was 23 years old, I became the GM. And that's the only way you get the job as a GM if, at 23 is if it was really one of the worst teams in the country. And I got that job and we were failing, you know, $268 in the bank account, 200 fans coming to our games. And the team had lost six figures the previous year. And, and I knew that we were going to continue to fail if we did what everyone else was going to do. And, and I believe normal gets normal results. And that's why I kind of developed the mantra, whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. And so I started reading every book on P.T. Barnum, on how to create attention, how to put on a show. I read every book on Walt Disney. And after about four years of putting on a show in Gastonia, I realized I can't be on the field pieing fans and celebrating and dancing and singing, looking like everyone else. I need to rock a tuxedo. And so I actually got a black tuxedo with tails like P.T. Barnum, my first show, but it was 102 degrees and I almost melted. And so the next night I looked for a yellow one and found it, overnighted it, and the next night, next game, people were like, wow, I want a picture, the yellow tux guy, this fits you so much, and it just became me, and when I put this on, it's my uniform, when I put it on, it, it's showtime, and so it's, uh, I have about seven right now, I've worn it at every single show, every single game since 2011, 2012. And this was pre-bananas, so tell everybody about what you're up to now, and that, that's a perfect segue. I was very fortunate when uh, in 2009, after we started to have success in in Gastonia, our first team, literally uh, we went from, you know, 200 fans to a thousand fans a game by doing things like grandma beauty pageants and dancing players and salute to underwear nights and flatulence fun nights. We tried it all. And luckily we were hosting a conference after that first year because people were intrigued and I was sharing what we were doing. And my soon to be later on wife, Uh, her boss was there at the conference and heard me talking and called her and said, I met the guy you're going to marry. And she's like, what? He's like, he does all these fun things. And so Emily was working for a minor league team. And so we kept in touch and she joined me in Gastonia and we kept, you know, going to 2000 fans a night, 3000 fans a night. We were working together. She was the director of fun. She would wear a hot dog costume at every game. And uh, long story short, at the last game of the 2014 season, I had her family in town at the game. I had my family. We had a sold out crowd of 4,000 fans and I stopped the game and dropped to a knee and proposed. And thank goodness she said yes, because I was in the tux in front of 4,000 fans. 
and they had a fireworks show go off, delayed the game crazily for like 30 minutes. The umpires were like, are we going to play? I'm like, we'll get to it. This is our moment here. And uh, that night when I was asleep, she surprised me with a trip to Savannah, Georgia. Never had been. And uh, we went to the minor league ballpark, and there was a New York Mets affiliate team playing there. And I fell in love with the ballpark, 1926 Stadium. Babe Ruth played there, Hank Aaron, Lou Gehrig, big, majestic brick columns. I walked in like a kid in a candy store. I was like, this is amazing. And then I walked up the bleachers and saw less than 200 people there for a beautiful Saturday night to watch a professional baseball game. And it was that moment I knew we need to be here. And so I called the commissioner of the league and said, hey, if this team leaves, we're coming here. He was like, sure, Jesse, whatever you say. And lo and behold, they couldn't get the support, so they left town. And we somehow convinced the city to let myself, my wife, our 24-year-old president, and three 22-year-olds come in and run a baseball team at this majestic stadium. And so uh, you can go on from there. But we ended up failing miserably for over a year. I mean, ultimate huge failures. And then uh, we figured out a few things after that. Yeah, and the, right there when you say – we failed miserably. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of us as, as entrepreneurs, it's so common. But I also hear that you don't refer to it as failures. So you use the word flop opportunities. Oh, I've never heard that one, but I like it. I, I will definitely take there? credit for it. Did I make oh, that up? Oh, flop opportunities. Yes, I shared it in the book. I'm sorry. Yes, I shared. <laughs> Thank you. Flop opportunities. I, you know, it's funny. I never, I, uh, I, I put that word in there as fun, and I never reference it until now. So this is amazing. Yes, flop opportunity. Okay, Thank you so I'm that. just saying, I, I read the book, Jesse. <laughs> you're on the book. I know. Five years ago, I got to remember flop opportunities. I know. Opportunities. Uh, no, you it's know a what? Great There's reference. a lot. Yeah, I totally get it. I won't ask you everything from the book, but but flop opportunities. When I heard that, I thought about all the times that I failed in my career, and I think if you play a big game, you're going to fail. That's just, that's given, yes. but you're okay. going to succeed too. So talk about that. Well, yeah, I, I think now we look at failure as discovery. And so if you look at failure equals discovery, what can you discover today to help you be better in the long run and as a flop opportunity? Uh, so for us, yeah, I mean, we failed because we were scared to stand out. When we came to Savannah, there was professional baseball. We weren't professional baseball. I didn't wear the yellow tuxedo because I was coming into this bigger city you know, Gastonia was a small little town. Savannah is a big city, 14 million tourists. Everyone knows Savannah. And we were trying to be like everyone else. When you try to be like everyone else, you're going to get results like everyone else. In fact, we got much worse than everyone else. You know, when we showed up, the phone lines were cut, the internet lines were cut. We grabbed a picking table, put it into an abandoned storage building and started calling people and they could care less. You know, they were like, oh, it's just another baseball team to fail. And as much as we told them we were not like every other baseball team, they had no proof. We were just, we were just all talk. And so we only sold two tickets in our first three months. And by January of 2016, we got the call that we'd overdrafted our account and we were completely out of money. And that was when Emily and I looked at me and said, we have to sell our house. We emptied our savings account, put the few dollars we had in the team, we're sleeping on an airbed. And I think those six months of failure, of going to Walmart with only $30 to grocery shop for the entire week for the two of us, shared that I don't ever want to try to be like everyone else. We have to go different. We have to go big. And we have to really be memorable to people. And so that's when, you know, that was a big failure that just changed everything for us. Because it's like, no, we're not going to name the team like everyone else. You know, we named the team after a fruit. The only team named after a fruit. We came up with a senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas. We came up with our male cheerleading team called the Mananas. You know, our mascot split. You know, we have a breakdancing coach, a banana pep band, banana babies before every game. We do music videos to can't stop the peeling. We literally thought of everything we can to be different. And then people started talking. And I think you can't get the hearts of people until you first get their eyes and their ears. And I think that's the biggest challenge. People are like, oh, they should love us. Well, you, have you loved them? And so all of that failure, I think, is everything that I don't like talking about failure other than saying, hey, that's a new learning experience. That's a new discovery. That's a new opportunity to do something different. That's where I like going. So if I walk into the Savannah grocery store, and I grab some people and I say, hey, have you heard of the Savannah Bananas? What do you think of them? What, what do you think they'll say? <laughs> we sold two tickets in our first three months. And after that failure and after the struggle, we sold out every single game. Now, our wait list is over 12,000 for tickets. We have 1.2 million social media followers. Uh, we have uh, 250,000 more followers than every single Major League Baseball team. The Cubs, the Dodgers, the Yankees on TikTok. 
ESPN flew down this summer, CBS Sports flew down this summer, USA Today flew down this summer. And now, you know, that you asked that question, I pinched myself because we were sleeping on an airbed. But as we just visited seven cities, and I wasn't wearing the yellow tuxedo, every restaurant we went to, people came over. Every restaurant. Uh, when we were in town, people came over. And it's, I've never, I've never imagined this. When we went and did our one city world tour in Mobile, Alabama last year, hundreds of miles from Savannah, we sold 7,000 tickets in 24 hours. Had people come in from over 17 states. And it's because we've learned to know what makes us different. And I think very few businesses, they always want to try to be a little bit better, a little bit cheaper, a little bit faster. But what can you be the only? And when you can be the only, that's when you don't have to do marketing. We failed marketing for six months worse than anyone ever. Now we spend $0 on marketing, but we spend everything on the experience. And then we have our fans do the marketing for us. So what, tell me, you talked about the, the banana nanas, some of these, but tell me at your crux, for somebody that's listening and saying, okay, I hear you, Jesse. I hear that we get to be unique, mm -hmm. but where do I start? What do you have to say for that? What do you want to be known for? So like you said, I started the book with how do I want to be remembered? That's a good start. If you were to write a eulogy for your business, what would that say? Your business goes another 100, 200 years. Like for instance, I was crushed when the Barnum Bailey, you know, the, the circus after 146 years shut down a few years ago. What would their eulogy have said? How much joy, how much fun, how many people did they serve? So when you start there, what do you want to be known for? That, then you go backwards, then you go, what makes you different? And then you keep specializing, keep going down further that thing. And, and whoever says the most and the least amount of words wins. So for instance, our North Star, the name of our business is Fans First Entertainment. We exist to make baseball fun, but how do we do that? Fans first, entertain always. Every decision we ask, is it fans first? So I would challenge any business, not only know what, what do they want to be known for, what makes them different. I would say, how are you going to create fans? See, Kathleen, there's a different conversation. Most people, what they do, they'll sit down, they'll have a meeting, they say, how are they going to generate revenue? How are they going to generate sales? How are they going to market to customers? Our meetings are different. We say, what are we going to do to create fans today? What are we going to do to create fans this month, this quarter, this year? And when you change that conversation, all of a sudden your fans come from out of nowhere. And so, you, you know, and I share in the book and more now, we have no ticket fees, no convenient fees, which are the most inconvenient fees in the world. All right. Every ticket for the Savannah Bananas is all inclusive. All your burgers, hot dogs, chicken sandwiches, soda, water, popcorn, dessert, everything. Now you come to the ballpark, 20 bucks, you got everything. All right. Shipping, you want merchandise, you get literally free shipping always, not just free shipping weekend. And like, oh, Amazon does that. Well, Amazon, you pay $100 prime to do it. It is just sure. free. You can come get us first time free shipping. You'll get in a custom yellow box. It'll have a delivered fresh stamp on it. We'll have custom yellow tissue paper. You'll get a free koozie, a free decal, and a note from us. And then you get a thank you call, and we send videos. Because we didn't ask, how do we make more money? That wouldn't be the right answer. How do you make more money if you charge more shipping? You don't give away free stuff. You don't spend dollars on the packaging. But when you create fans, it changes. No, no team in the country or the world was as dumb as us two years ago. Kathleen, this was the dumbest move we could have ever made. February 25th, 2020, we said we are creating the first ever ad-free stadium. We are eliminating all of our sponsorship, all of our advertising from the entire ballpark. Washington Post did a story. The industry ripped us apart. What are you guys doing? This is where all your money comes from. We said, no. When we asked the conversation, how do we create fans? I don't believe one fan comes to our ballpark to be advertised to, marketed to, sold to, or promoted to. They come to have fun. So we eliminated that, threw away hundreds of thousands of dollars with no answer on how we were going like, to bring it back. But you know what's happened in the last two years? Our merchandise alone has become seven figures plus. And we make now three times the amount of money in merchandise to our fans than we did in advertising revenue. And these are fans that are everywhere around the world. Yeah, it's a funny story. We had no idea. Our first shipment of T-shirts came in. There were too many N's on the shirt for bananas. We literally spelled bananas wrong. And then we, people were buying merchandise all over the world. We, originally, we had $5 shipping. And we were doing $5 shipping shirts to the U.K. and to Australia. We were, as a dad joke would say, we were losing our shirt outrageously on that. Uh, and then we had Excel sheets we were printing out. We had no idea what we were doing. And then we were bringing all of the, the boxes to the post office. The post office was like, you know, 
we can bring a, a, a truck to you guys. We're like, oh, that'd be amazing. So we were doing two or three trips. So then the last few years, they brought a truck to us every day. And then finally, we had so many bins of merchandise, one, two, three, four bins. It didn't fit in the small truck. So now they send a big, huge truck every day to send merchandise. And we didn't know what we're doing. We still don't. But when you you're creating fans, people it. are weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're still figuring it out. Yeah. Oh, I love it. All right, we're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, there's more. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership, with my new friend and guest, Jesse Cole. Enjoy this quick break. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspire Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspirechoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. And we are here with my new friend and guest, Jesse Cole. Jesse runs Fans First. And Jesse, thank you so much again for being here. Are you okay if we play during this next segment? You know, that's what I do best here at the ballpark. Awesome. So one of the things we just, we were just talking about how we actually apply what you're talking about into the business. And if you're okay, where I'd like to go next is really understanding in my business, I told you I have what I, two businesses, my speaking and my coaching business, and then we also own these martial arts studios. We actually have our strategic planning. We're working on that now for what does it look like? We've been the baby. We've been the toddler. We've been the adolescent. Now we are looking at adulthood. What does that look like for us? What does 10, 20, 30 years look like? And the stuff that we're talking about is really key. So we know we get to stand out. We know we get to find our yellow tux. Where do we go? <laughs> did you skip puberty, by the way? Yeah, no, that was rough. We did that. <laughs> that okay, you rough. went through that. All right. The, yeah, I'm the like, growing pain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're asking the steps for where your business goes? Yeah, we, we have a solid business. We've got great uh, membership. We've got the continual membership. But we get to create the fans, like what you're saying. We get to be – we we are known on a, a Midwest scale, but we, we know something really cool is happening, and it's beyond just martial arts. It's beyond taekwondo. But it's, yeah. there's words there that I can't articulate yet. So what's that inspiring vision? I, I think for us – you know, I can go into the how to create fans, and that's what in the next book I have the five E's to creating raving fans. But I think for us during COVID, you know, to be in the live entertainment business, probably similar to being in a gym business, can be challenging uh, during COVID. Uh, I would say most sports teams took a huge loss, and we took a seven-figure hit. However, we did remain profitable without changing any salaries because of the fans that we built. But during that time, the most important thing for us wasn't just taking care of our team, wasn't just, you know, being profitable. It was creating a vision. And, and the book that helped us as a leadership team, we got together and we read The Vision Driven Leader by Michael Hyatt. And it shared uh, the steps to create a vision, to focus on what, what isn't versus what is, to think exponentially, not incrementally, to not focus on the how, focus on the what and the where. And we put all that together and we spent months saying, is this an inspiring vision? We came to Savannah and we were told we were gonna fail. But after five years, we sold out every game. The wait list is in the thousands. We've, we've accomplished our first steps, toddler, infancy, puberty. But what's that next step? What's that bigger vision? What's that exponential? And then we started to ask questions and, and ask, what if? What if we didn't just play one season? What if we played year-round? What if we didn't just play in Savannah? 
what if we created banana land where it's not just a ballpark? And when you ask all those what if questions, I noticed our leadership team start to lean in, start to get very excited, start to get fired up. You could feel they were talking faster. They had energy. And all of a sudden, it was the most excited I saw our team in five years. And so what we did is we wrote this vision out, starts with the founder. I did a majority of the writing, shared it with the leadership team, got on the same page with the leadership team. And we made mistakes. I wrote the impact and no one got excited about it. It's like the bananas will be a household day. We'll play over the wall. No one cared. We cared about, you know, where the reunion, where families come together, you know, where we're, there's military surprises, where the anniversary, where were people come together, where they belong. And then I started to share the impact and then you could see them lighting up. So long story short, what we did is we prepared our vision and then we shared it with our whole team. We have it uh, digitally, you know, graphics, well done. We did a video where I'm narrating it and showing video of what we're trying to create. And we announced it to the press. And the press put it on the front page of the paper, prepare for bananas year round. They're going all over. And we put our vision out because of the accountability. What's amazing in one year, <laughs> we announced that we would go to eight cities within the next five years. Within one year, we're about to announce we're going to go to about seven cities just this year alone. Mm. Because when you put an inspiring vision, you work towards it, and you don't slow down, and you keep going. And so that was a big step for us. So what is that vision? And it doesn't just inspire you as the founder, the leader, the entrepreneur. What inspires your team? And so we did that. We did our people, our promotion, our sales, our, our, our marketing. And, you know, literally, we just laid it all out, our products, everything. Sure. And so what I'm hearing you have your foundation, but you're really launching from there and saying, yeah, how do we, how do we go, how do we go on this, this national tour, inter, the international tour? Have you looked at that? Are you guys going international? We've been, we've been reached out to by uh, numerous countries, ironically. I'm like, I don't think it's going to happen right now with still COVID in the back, but we'll, we'll get there. But yes, we started with a grand vision that was inspiring, that was larger than life, that we didn't know how to do it. You know, if anyone says, oh, we'll do this next year, we're going to increase by 10 you can do that. Come up with something that you don't know how to do it. That's what makes it exciting. Yeah. And scary, which is so like, let's talk about that. What happens when you put something out there that's totally scary because you don't know how to do it, and yet you get to create it? Amazon put out a huge announcement, publicity, press, about the Fire phone. They put it out. They said, this is going to be the new phone. Spent $200 million on it. It failed. How many people are talking about Amazon Fire Phone right now? Nobody. Nobody. And Amazon's doing okay. I wish I had a lot more money so I could buy every share of Amazon possible. But what Amazon learned from Fire Phone, they don't share much. They learned the technology to help work on uh, Amazon Echo, Alexa, which Alexa has taken over the world. So that was a $200 million failure. That was probably the best failure you could have. So they put that out in the world. It doesn't matter. We've put promotions every night on the field that fail miserably. Every night, the horse race. We do races where people like delay the game. Like we've done some things like living pinata, where we're literally having dads hit with bats and throw candy. It's just a disaster. No one remembers that. And so the example I always give is that the guy who failed the most in Major League Baseball, who struck out more than anyone else, I ask this question every keynote I make. And I think I've had one person get it, a baseball buff. Do you have any idea, by, uh, any curiosity? Who, who struck out more than anyone else? No one knows. But he struck out more than everyone else because he's not known for his strikeouts. He's known for his three home runs in game six of the 1977 World Series to propel the Yankees to a World Series championship. He's known as Mr. October. He's a Hall of Famer. It's Reggie Jackson. They don't remember your failures. They remember the hits. They remember the home runs. We don't talk about Amazon Fire Phone. We talk about the hits. So to me, it's, it's scary not to put something out. I want to put everything out, and I want to find out what we can accomplish. You, what I'm remembering, so Albert Einstein, you're, have you ever heard what he did on the board? No, this I'm is, intrigued. Cool story. So Albert Einstein, so you know, a few years ago, he walks up to this board, and he, said, he starts writing nine times one is nine, nine times two is 18. He goes all the way up to nine times 10. And he writes nine times 10 is 91. And then he walks away from the board. And I've done this exact same exercise just in the last three weeks. I've done it four times. And what's so interesting is that of the four times that I've done it, I got the exact same reaction that Albert Einstein got. And that what happened was the people in the audience were like talking to themselves, snickering, saying, you got it wrong. And they were yeah, only you said it as soon as you said it. Yeah. <laughs> Nine times 10 equals 91. They're so focused on the one time that didn't work, they missed out on the nine times. And it wasn't about 
Albert Einstein, he intentionally did that. It was about how we focus on what didn't work and that holds mm -hmm. us back. Nobody really cares, but really- That's a great that, example. Yeah, I, mean, I saw that and I, I remember literally I stole that, from, I borrowed it from Albert Einstein. I mean, beautiful way to demonstrate where we focus our attention. And what I hear you saying is, why? Nobody really in the big scheme of things cares. When I was a kid, I was five years old, my, uh, I played baseball and t-ball. And my dad would say, Jess, swing hard in case you hit it. And every time I came up to bat, he would say, swing hard in case you hit it, which is very funny advice when you think about it. And I swung and missed a lot. But when I made contact, I was one of the first kids to hit a home run over the fence. And you don't remember the swings and misses. And so I think I've taken that philosophy from my dad on everything I do. Might as well swing hard. You know, we literally, we invented a brand new game. In our, in our mission to be fans first, we invented banana ball, which is a whole other story. We started three years ago testing. One of the rules is no bunting. Because if you're going to come up to the bat, swing the bat. We literally have no bunting. And it says no bunting. Bunting sucks. Like that's part of the, the rules of the game. And so my point is, it's like, we don't need to go up to bat and try to just bunt, try to just move the ball over, try to have a little incremental gain, try to go from 20 customers to 25 customers. Swing hard. And you may miss a bunch, but when you make contact, it'll make a bigger impact than 10 months in a row. So this is reminding me of watching little kids play flag football, because you keep saying, if you just make these little passes, you'll make it down the field. And these kids are like, no way, I'm going to throw the 50-yard pass and it's going to make it. And 15 times, you know, in the whole game, maybe one time it'll work. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's what I hear you saying. Of just go for it. Who cares? It, exactly. And that, if you think of everything we've done, like people would, no one would be crazy enough to eliminate all their advertising from their stadium. No one would be crazy. I mean, no baseball team has no shipping. No baseball team doesn't have any ticket fees or convenience fees. Or No baseball team would make their whole stadium all you can eat. Well, you're going to lose money when they could buy a burger or they could buy a hot dog. No. Create the best possible experience. Let's swing hard. And it fails. Like, I think so many people, Kathleen, they quit when it's messy. So, for instance, you have to be willing to get through the messy to get to the good. And what I've learned, we had one hockey team. It was like, this is all you can eat. Amazing. We have to do it. They lasted a few games. I just read this story in the Wall Street Journal. A movie theater said during this time, we got to come up with an all-inclusive. $25 gets all your food and the movie. And they didn't get that many people that came out to the first Labor Day weekend. They stopped doing it. We quit because it's hard and because we see, oh, that didn't work as well. Our first night serving all you can eat. Of course, we had no idea how to do it. We went through 10,000 pieces of meat in an hour. We were preparing 2,500 pieces of meat. So what did that mean? People waited for almost three hours to get food. They waited from like the first inning to the seventh inning. It was the worst experience in the world. But because of the vision, we said, if we figure this out, it will be magical. Parents will never have to pull money out of their pockets. Kids can get a drink or a cookie or popcorn, whatever they want. It'll be a better experience. If you can imagine what the best, most amazing fan experience is, you have to be willing to get through the messy to get to the good because it will be worth it. And now at our ballpark, everyone gets fed within five minutes. They get whatever they need, and it's going to be good. And so it sounds like you've had fans that have embraced that. Did you have people that were angry and anything but fans in that first experience? We have angry fans all the time. I mean, when we came up with the Savannah Banana Dame, you know, I shared in the book, the owner should be thrown out of town. You guys are an embarrassment to the city. You'll never sell a ticket. I mean, we were ripped apart because people didn't understand. And Jeff Bezos says it always, you need to be willing to be misunderstood. You know, no one said they wanted this black always on cylinder inside their house that listens to them that looks like a Pringles can and that you can play mute. No one, no one said that, you know, it was misunderstood. But once you get to use it, so yeah, we get criticism with that. We got criticism with eliminating ads. And now where we get most criticism from baseball traditionalists. When we started launching Banana Ball, a two hour time game where you can steal first, where batters can't step out, where if fans catch a foul ball, it's an out in the game. Traditionalists are like, we don't want this. And I say, thank you, but this isn't for you. Most companies think about who they're targeting. They don't think, who are they not for? We are so clear. We are not for baseball traditionalists. I'm an owner in a yellow tuxedo. Are you kidding me? What else do we need to say? It's a circus and a baseball game will break out. And so I think you need to be willing to get criticized, but it's okay to get criticized by the people you're not for. 
we started doing reviews on our podcast of people that ripped us apart. One woman wrote a six-page blog saying it's an absolute circus. They got this Willy Wonka character running around the stadium. You need to put in earplugs because there's always music. I shared that review. That's exactly what we want people to say. So I think when you're very clear on who you are and what you stand for, you need to be criticized. If you're not getting criticized, you're playing it too safe. Mm, that, that rings true in so many ways. And a lot of the decisions that we've made in our businesses that there's been the, the critics and they're loud. But what I hear you saying is they're going to be there and that's okay. That's part of playing it big. Embrace them. That means you're actually on the right step to actually making a difference. Because if, if, you know who doesn't get noticed? People that aren't doing anything. When you're actually making a difference and making an impact, you will get noticed and there will be people talking. They will be vocal. That's what excites me. I, 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 get, I thrive on people saying, you can't be doing a world tour. You can't have a professional team doing this. You're a college summer team. Bring it. That fires me up. Yeah, when people say you can't, it's like challenge accepted. Well, we all need fuel, and, and again, people can look at it as negative, and they can hold them back, or, and I'm not going to use it, as, you know, other than sharing a few of those negative comments people said about the name, I don't share all the people that tell us that we're going to fail at certain things. What I do, it just, it, it, it drives me, it's fuel to say, well, what about the people that we get those comment, those amazing compliments from, and saying, thank you for bringing this to our city. You know, when a, when a father and his wife and their three kids came up to me in a game during COVID, and we had to play with a very small crowd, but we were able to play. Um, and he came up to me after the game and said, wow, thank you. And I go, oh, thank you. I go, did you come into town? He goes, yeah, we drove 40 hours from Utah for this game and we're driving 40 hours back tomorrow. And it was everything I'd hoped for. Thank you for bringing this to our family. And I'm like, bringing this, you drove 40 hours. You're the crazy one. But that's what we live for. We live for that impact, that 40 hour drive home. They were probably talking about their three hour experience with the bananas. And I'm sure they still do to this day. That's worth it. Not the people that say you shouldn't be doing this. Wow. Oh, okay. We're going to go on a quick break. What a great, think about that. Somebody that's willing to drive 80 hours to experience what you're putting out there. And that is, that's a dream of mine to not that they'll drive 80 hours, but that somebody cares enough. So we're going to go on this quick break. I'm going to leave that with you here and we'll see you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. And for the last 30 minutes, I've had the honor and pleasure of introducing you to my friend, Jesse Cole. We've been talking all about finding your yellow tux, how you can make your business and yourself so unique that you can stand out. So, Jesse, I want to talk a little bit about you. Bring it. Awesome. Okay. So, tell me, you carry a lot of energy. Amazing. What, how do you maintain that? Do you, do you get tired? <laughs> My wife would say, uh, yes, Jesse, every night, as soon as you come to bed and we're about to talk, you start falling asleep. So, yes, I do get tired. <laughs> this is something I get asked about energy a lot. And energy is a, a very important topic, especially for leaders and for parents, for spouses, for everyone that we're trying to juggle. I think today, more than ever, we're trying to balance uh, and do more than we've ever done before. And that's expected because everyone's watching, you know, social media, what are you doing? And busy is a badge of honor, which I wrote in the book, should not be a badge of honor. We do not need, if anyone says they're busy, I say something's wrong. All right. You shouldn't be busy. You should have control of your schedule. So how do you get energy? 
And so uh, I've studied this because I've asked this, been asked this question so much and I just never had a good answer. And I started looking at where does the energy come from? And anytime I get asked a question like that, I reverse engineer and I say, all right, well, what's giving me energy and what's taking energy away from me? And I realized when I first started in the business, even at 23, 24 years old, there were certain things that I did with the business, all the details, the finance, the sponsorship, the planning, the operations, all those things. If I had a day where I was going through the details of our finances and then I had to put up signs around the ballpark, I'd get home at five o'clock and be like, <gasps> and I'd pass out. But then I started realizing days that I was out promoting and talking about what we're doing and sharing our story and coming up with creative ideas, I would be full of energy. and I could work 10 hours straight. So I, come in, I came up with this concept again. Everyone talks about what do you love? What do you like to do? And what's your passion? I, I ask a different question. What gives you energy? Create your energy list. And if you ask what gives you energy, for instance, for me, what I realized, it's creating, sharing, and growing. And what that means broken down. If I'm coming up with ideas, like the idea of delivering bottle service from the Banana Nanas to one of our players at bat, which we came up with the other day, or our flower girl doing flower petals for our batter coming up to a bat, or any of these crazy ideas, I get fired up, all right? The idea of putting a mechanical bowl in our bullpen for our pitcher to be warming up by riding the bowl and then take the mound, that gets me excited. Our players, uh, you know, literally skydiving to their positions to announce them to start the game, that fires me up. So creating, creating, this is creating. Sharing. This is sharing, going on a podcast, doing keynote speeches. I love that. Sharing stories with our team, get fired up by that and growing. I listen to a podcast every morning as I'm running. I'm reading every morning around the house. I do reading laps, which are very weird, but I just do laps reading over and over again. So any day that I'm doing that. So at the end of this day at 5, 530, when I go home to be with my kids, I can be my best for them because what I did during the day was all that things that were either creating, sharing, or growing. So how do I have energy? I do things that give me energy. <laughs> Yeah. What's a reading laugh that you hold? I imagine you're holding a book, walking around. Tell me about that. I literally do. I, so I try to do most of my calls. I do laps around the stadium. And when I read, I never read sitting down. I'm always reading and walking. I realize sometimes the best ideas and creativity come while you're moving. And Tony Robbins is big in this. I went to one of his things. He's like, we got to be moving. We got to be moving. He's always moving. And I think just sitting in place, even meetings, Emily and I, we do walking meetings around the field. It just, it gets everything moving. It gets you free. It gets you thinking bigger. It doesn't get you thinking small. It keeps the energy up of a meeting. You know, same thing when we go out to a restaurant, Emily knows I'm, I always want the high top. High top is higher energy than sitting at a booth. It's little things like that that I notice. Music. I, when I went to Vegas to give a keynote, there's music everywhere. Wherever you go, outside, on the paths, in the resorts, there's music everywhere. There's a reason for that. It pumps up energy. So I put speakers all over our office, and we have a person who's in charge play music every day all day. And so it's those little triggers that also help energy, moving, music, et cetera. And I try to always keep that going. Got it. How many bananas do you eat? <laughs> Never ate a banana until I became part of the Savannah Bananas. So opening night, I had my first one and now I have one every morning. Nice. And do you have banana smoothies, like banana, what, what kind of banana treats are in the or actually, we have slippery, slippery banana. Uh, we sell it that by the gallon. So here at the stadium, it's unbelievable. It's a, it's a frozen. It's not a frozen. It's a, um, it's like a banana pina colada. And fans, it's only made with alcohol, so fans love it. Uh, we have a banana beer. We have a banana cream soda. We have frozen bananas. We have banana splits. We do very well in the banana theme. Eventually, we'll have of banana banana bread. <laughs> nice. Now, okay, little little shift here, but you work with your wife. Yes, very fortunate. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about that because you either that's a love it or hate it. I work with my husband and it's it's a wonderful situation for us. But I also know that, that there's a lot of people that that doesn't work for. So what are some of the secrets that you guys have utilized to make You've it work? You've probably learned a lot as well, but it's, it's, uh, it's boundaries on what our roles are. So for me, when I was to jump in everything she was doing, she'd be like, Jesse, you might as well do it. You're always thinking about this stuff. And I was like, it's about letting go. This is what she's best at. So she's our people. So we always say, love your customers more than you love your product. For us, love your fans even more than your product, but then love your people, your employees, even more than you love your customers. Emily is on that. Emily is on the love train. She has 1% of our total top line budget. So if you're 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, $100,000, $200,000 are only supposed to be used for surprise and delights. And Emily controls that. 
So we just sent one of our people who uh, loves golf to the Waste Management Golf Tournament. We've sent people to on cruises, to their bucket list trip to Ireland. We sent everyone to Disney. We, Emily does that. So she's on the heart of our business. She's making sure our people are taken care of. I am focused on the big vision, promoting, marketing, looking at where we are going as a team. And I'm the showman. I'm the face. She is, she is the heart. And when we're very clear on that, it makes it very easy for us to accomplish amazing things and also love each other while we're doing it. And your kids, how are they? Are they supportive? Do they understand what you're up to? <laughs> Maverick, when he was 27 days old, he became the banana baby for opening night on 2018. And so what is a banana baby? Every night we have a waiting list, over 100 right now. People, <laughs> parents that are getting pregnant or are pregnant, they put their kid on the banana baby wait list. It's ridiculous. So anyways, uh, banana baby, before every game, we bring all the players to home plate. We have put the baby in a banana costume, and the parent lifts the baby up, the, all 4,000 fans, and we sing, na Savania, na he. We told Emily, Maverick was born on May 4th. I go, Emily, Maverick's the banana baby opening day. She goes, he's going to be 27 days old. I go, perfect. He'll be even lighter. She goes, Jesse, I don't know if that's safe. I go, we got this. She goes, all right, well, I'm doing it. So uh, he became the banana baby on uh, 27 days old. The next year, he was involved in races on the field. The next year, he say, said, play ball, go bananas. And then uh, he's, he's a big part of what we do. He loves it. And it, because all of our games are streamed live with six cameras, he gets to, Daddy, I saw you again tonight. So every night when I'm working, if he's not at the game, he gets to watch me on TV. And we have a, a three-year-old foster daughter as well, and she's became, become a big part of it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's – they really get excited. Their favorite team is the Bananas. They say go minute with Bananas. They do videos. They're just, they're all in on it. So they're all, yeah. And that's what I've learned with, with my boys and the businesses that we're in. And they get more of the tangible, like the martial arts studio or the gyms that we had. They get that. The, the coaching and the speaking, they, if I say, what does mom do? They'll say, oh, she helps people. And that's, they, that's all they get, which, you know, that's great. I'm blown away right now because that's what Emily told Maverick and, and our foster daughter. That's what they told her uh, I do. That's what they told him I did. So it's like, Jesse's going to fly again. What is he doing? And Emily goes, well, he's actually helping people. And so now, Daddy, go help a lot of people today. And so I'm fortunate in the offseason. I give keynotes every week traveling. And it's like, go help some people, Jess, Daddy. And it's like, Daddy, did you help a lot of people today? And I show him a picture of, like, you know, a thousand-person keynote. He's like, Daddy, good job, because we taught him what encouragement means. And it's that stuff that, um, you know, you're just trying to teach how do you help, you know, you know this as a parent. I just, you know, how do you help people? How do you do more? And when we're working, we make money so that we can do more to help more people. And so we try to just teach that so they are encouraging us to work as well as what we do. That's, you know, there's something really key that I heard you say, and I want to call it forward. And I, I think you know this, but for everybody that's listening, when you say we get to earn money so that we can continue to help people or we can help more people, that's so key. I know my kids can grasp onto that. But if I just said, we want to make money so we can go on vacation, they don't get that. They just don't think like that. They want to serve. And how we instill that is, is so crucial so critical yeah so so the question we talked about earlier to go full circle we were talking about vision, oh. vision. and how do you have a vision for and so how do you have a vision for your family as well in addition to a vision for your for your business and so when i talk about us playing in 80 cities 100 cities playing at major league parks playing all over the world i, I literally I meet with emily we have a date night every week and we'll say all right how do we make this happen with our family you know, if the kids go to school, can they fly and meet us on the weekends? How do we make this happen within our goals for our family? And I think that's really important. A vision just, just for your business that doesn't actually help your family or help your life is just a wasted vision, in my opinion. And that's what we're trying to work on. Yeah, that's, and I can say, especially this is from our speaker perspective, that was one of the biggest challenges with me committing to speaking was what about the kids? And we homeschooled during COVID and it was beautiful. And you know, there wasn't a lot of speakers traveling at that point. But the virtual as well, there was just so many other things that we got to be a part of. And now we really think about that. This is the family life that we want to create. And it gets to be a part of everything else that we're doing. It's not separate. There aren't family life and work life. It's all together. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Okay. We are going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, there's more. We're going to wrap it all up on what you can create so that your business and yourself, you are a standout. All right. Enjoy this quick break. 
Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. And we have been talking to my friend and guest, Jesse Cole. We are super excited to share just how you can be a standout. We've covered so much in the last 45 minutes. And Jesse, if there's one thing that you want everybody to walk away with, knowing, hearing, really cementing in their being, what is it? <laughs> oh, geez. Well, on the back of our... Uh... On the back of our fans' first playbook that we share with everyone on our staff, so our players, before they can wear a banana's uniform, they have to go through our fans' first you, the banana's way. They have to learn who we are, what we stand for, and hear stories of what players do. And, you know, from, from literally the time I remember when two kids came up to one of our players and he said, they said, can we have your autograph? And he got down to a knee and said, only if I can have yours. And he started getting autographs of these five-year-olds on his hat. And now I watch our team, and our half our team has – Ethan, John, Susan, Alex, all over their hat. And we share those stories about what it's about. And so on the back of that fan's first playbook, it says, be patient in what you want for yourself, but be impatient in how much you give to others. And the reality is that has guided us with everything. That is fans first. We are impatient on how much we give to our fans, which doesn't make a lot of business sense in the beginning because we're, patients of, we're patient of the long term, what that can affect us. And I, I, I always say, create long-term fans over short-term profits. And when you do that, the money, the business, the people, the impact, the everything else will take care of itself. I hear you playing the long-term game with a short-term, you, you have a short-term focus, but you, you absolutely are playing a long-term game. Yeah, it's, it's, you have to play the long game. You know, I think so many businesses are focused on quarters. We're focused on quarter centuries. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm focused on the business that, uh, you know, Maverick and my kids are going to have. I'm focused. I want this in 100 plus years. I want to last a lot longer than the 146 that the circus lasted. And I think when you do that, then you realize that you don't need to make short-term decisions to try to make a few extra bucks. When we used to, our former team in Gastonia, we used to turn people away that would bring food and soda into our ballpark. And that's normal. Every stadium in the country, no food and drink. That's short-term. A family that bought, went, goes to Chick-fil-A and has Chick-fil-A meal, and they're going to have it inside your stadium, they walk out, and you tell them that they can't come in your stadium. And I did this. And I had them sit on – they sat on the concrete at 100 degrees. And I watched they finished their meal, and they looked inside the stadium, the dad and mom and two young kids. And the dad and the mom said, let's just go home. And that broke my heart because not only did it hurt that family, it showed what we were doing. We were focused on short term instead of the long game. And so now, <laughs> secret of Savannah Bananas, you can bring food and drinks, you can bring stuff in our ballpark. You know, we want, we're focused on that, creating that fan for life. And so it's a different game. Yeah, I hear you. And, and the results speak for themselves. You've got waiting lists. You've got the merchandise. So you've got all the results. So if somebody's listening to you right now and they want to, they want more Jesse, they want to see the Savannah Bananas, how do they get a hold of you? How do they find out more? <laughs> I, sp- I personally spend most of my time on LinkedIn, so I post regularly on there. Uh, if you search Yellow Tux, you can find me. But Savannah Bananas, you know, I challenge, uh, you know, I always tell groups to watch the documentary, uh, Savannah Bananas Story, or the ESPN. They flew down, they did a feature, too, called it The Greatest Show in Baseball. I think you can understand some of, you know, who we are and what we stand for. And I, I believe that I hope our story can inspire people to think differently, to think about creating fans and, and not play the game that everyone else is playing. It's not as fun, and it doesn't have as much purpose behind it. Yeah, I hear you. So what? So they can reach out to you on LinkedIn. You mentioned the documentary. Where can they find the documentary? Uh, you search Savannah Banana Story on Google, on YouTube. You know, our videos, we have thousands of videos. We, we brought in an intern our first year, and he said he could create videos. We said, let's do that a lot. And same thing with TikTok. We just started creating TikTok videos, and now 900,000 followers on TikTok. You know, we got plenty of videos out there. Very easy to find, savannahbananas.com. I saw the videos of uh, the the after game interviews in the bathroom. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> normal do the exact opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So so is that the intern? That's, who's the who's the guy that had to stick his head under with the the microphone? 
Oh, jeez. Now, Biko became our broadcast entertainer. So, yeah, he's done interviews in the shower, in a full suit in the shower. He's done interviews in ice baths. He's done interviews in a bathroom stall. Uh, he's done interviews in players' beds, literally coming out of the covers. Uh, so, again, we said that's kind of a mindset. You know, you think about how, do invoices differently. Do email signatures differently. Do your, your regular marketing differently. Like, we look at, hey, a post-game interview doesn't need to be an interview with just a guy on a microphone at a press conference setup. So that's kind of how we were inspired to come up with new ideas. That's uh, beautiful. And I think I saw him in Beauty and the Beast. He was wearing the bell costume too, right? Yes, he did dress up as a, and had a nice date. Well, we actually have our players go on dates every game. So uh, literally with little girls on, and they have flowers. And we have our players deliver flowers to little girls in the crowd. And so we, we saw that. That's such a creep, great moment. Why don't you create that for two grown men? We thought it'd be fun. So then do they – do, do you have families that are saying, I want my daughter to have this experience? Oh, yeah. We're very fortunate. I mean, we get, you know, we were just four, four kids figuring it out when we first started. You know, now we have yeah. 25, 25 full-time year-round people and about 200 part-time. So it's become a, uh, you know, I found out yesterday on, you talked about the list before, there's 750 people on our wait list to be interns with us. So just to be able to work with us and, you know, everyone's leaving jobs left and right. You look at every fast food marquee, it says hiring, hiring, hiring. You know, I was told we have wait list 750 and I think um, that, that makes me very proud. So yes, we, we, uh, we've been fortunate. Yeah, I think this is what's so cool because I want to point this out right before we're going to, we just have a couple minutes left, but what you're talking about is the people that you're really looking at, at Disney and, and Barnum and some of these companies and we think when we think of those companies, we tend to think these are big companies with big pocketbooks. I mean, huge pocketbooks. And what I hear you saying is, you, it doesn't matter the size of the company. That's irrelevant. It, it's it's easier when you first start. Do the things that are unscalable. I learned this from Brian Chesky with Airbnb. He actually went into the original Airbnbs when they first started, and he took all the pictures because he wanted high quality pictures. That is completely unscalable. We call every single fan that buys merchandise or buys a ticket from us and give them a personal thank you call. That's completely unscalable. Annie Stanley said it best, do for one what you wish you could do for many. And so as a small company, whatever your size is, how can you create fans? Create one new fan a day. It could be a thank you letter that you send to a fan. It could be a video. Like I do so many, literally, I grab my phone, I go up to the top of our bleachers and I said, hey, it's Jesse Cole, Savannah Bananas here. I just wanna thank you so much for that message you sent, you made an impact on me. And boom, send it to him. I recorded seven videos before we did this this morning. And so those are little moments that create fans. That doesn't create any direct revenue, but people spend most of their time saying, I gotta do more sales calls, I gotta do more marketing. Do things to create fans. And I'm sorry, I preach it so much because I've seen it. I see why we get emails and messages and people that travel from all over the country just to come to see one game. It's because they're a fan, they're not a customer. There's a different, it's a different thing and it's a different conversation. And I wish every business had conversations daily on how do we create fans. It'll be a happier world. Everyone will have more purpose and it'll be an amazing place to be a part of it. That's what I want. That's what I want to try to build. It's a movement. Yeah, I hear your passion. I hear your energy. I hear your excitement and I hear your drive for us to really think as, as a fellow business owner, as someone who has the ability to create something incredible, to do it. And just be willing to go there, be willing to look weird, be willing to be made fun of or whatever else might come up for there, but be willing to go there. Yes. You want, you want to tease? I'll give the five, I'll give the five E's. That is, if you, so how do you create fans? And I give some examples. Here, here's the, I'll give really quickly the five E's. First one, eliminate friction. Put yourself in the customer's shoes and think about every friction point in your experience. We actually go undercover every night in our stadium. I took the yellow tuxedo. We park with the fans. We walk in with the fans. We sit with the fans. We eat with the fans. And all we keep track of is friction points. So look at your experience. What are the friction points that makes it harder for people to do business with you? Number two, E, entertain always. Look at how can you entertain. Look at all the points, places. You know, we can entertain. Entertain means to, uh, to bring enjoyment and bring amusement. So is your invoice entertaining? Is your voicemail entertaining? Is your hold music entertaining? Or is it just like everyone else? But three, experiment constantly. You know, uh, our success is a direct function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per week, per day. That's a quote from Jeff Bezos. How many experiments are you doing this week, this month to create fans? Number four, engage deeply. All right. Do for one what you wish you could do for many. Find out that unique instance where someone really needs you. Do something special for them. You don't need to do it for everyone. Find those moments. And finally, the fifth, empower action. How do you empower your team to take these chances? To don't be scared of failure. To take that swing, like my dad said, swing hard in case you hit it. If you do one of those E's, 
you will create more fans. If you do all oh, five, you're going to have Jesse, Raven fans. thank on. you so much for being on here. I can't thank you enough. Everybody, catch us next Monday. We're here every Thank you for listening Monday. to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Kathleen Reeson will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Have a great week.